On today's show, we dive back into the truth about running backs, and this is where it starts to get really interesting. Those mid-tier guys talking about some James Conner action. Do I take that loss? Talk, Joe Mixon. Talking about Joe Mixon. Does Andy take the W? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Thursday, January 23rd. Were those hiccups, Mike? Was nope. that... Those are those, those are, are hits? Uh, those are hype grunts. One thing I noticed from the listeners, from the fans, from the Foot Clan, especially the YouTube universe, they're really not coping properly with the lack of the it's football time on Thursday's episode. It's oh. like they think you forgot to do it. They well, don't understand that, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I have bad news. Not happening for a La- while. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not <laughs> football time. It's not <laughs> football time. And it will not be. There will be things along the way. There will be a draft. There will be, oh, combine? Pfft. Yeah, you'll hit yeah. that. It's combine time. We still yeah. got a when Super Bowl. Happens. But we don't Super record Bowl. the show and release it on Sunday. That's it's true. all about the release day. Yes. If the combine's happening, I mean, I, this is my assumption. And look, Jason, the, the syllables. It's Super Bowl time. Like this Yeah, just, come on, yeah. Jason. It's big. Oh, big game. You can go with a big game. <laughs> it's big game time. <laughs> Great. Welcome into the show. Running back truth part two today. We're going to recap beat the ballers from the weekend. I did realize we didn't talk about one player in our recap. <laughs> oh, yeah, that is. So let's start there. I mean, how funny is it that his first touchdown of the season since week one happens oh, in yes. prime time because of course it does. Nobody started him in a fantasy lineup. This is this is how nobody even go. probably started him in a playoff beat the ballers lineup. Who's touching that man? Yeah. So so we are I, we're already uh, so scaly working on. I'm 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 changing all of our uh, spreadsheets, our our docs behind the scenes for the 2020, 2020 UDK, man. which pre-sale starts. On the Super Bowl time, um, <laughs> but the reality is, we're we're in this in between phase where I can look at every single uh, projection we made last year down to you know down to every passing attempt and completion target target and, and what what their results were and just look across the board how did we do on everything and it was so funny to see Sammy Watkins it's like oh I had him down for seven touchdowns he got three mm-hmm. in week, in week one. one and then nothing. That, that was fun to look at this morning. We were we were going through like the rookies, looking at how we projected Miles Sanders, Devin Singletary, some of those players, Dalvin Cook. After, you know, had the big year. Um, yeah, we we hit on quite a few. It was fun to look at. Um, there were certainly it was funny the big outliers. Like we all projected Christian McCaffrey to be very to perform very well this year, but then you look at the stat line of what we projected to what he did because you can't. We can't pro- in good conscience. <laughs> exactly, you, you can't project a man for what he did. No, that's not fair. That's not right. You can't project. I mean, like the projections were. I, I had very good projections for Derrick Henry, right? But not really, and for Michael Thomas, except not really because we didn't project super otherworldly career years. Yeah, you can't, and you can't go in and, and project twenty touchdowns for somebody. You know, no. over the course of a year, 15 total touchdowns. Apparently, we are still giving away a signed Sammy Watkins helmet <laughs> at footclangiveaway.com. Oh, see, that's why. That's why he that's delivered. That's why he, he had a big game because he's like, oh, man, I got to boost the value of that helmet. So let me narrow the focus of this promotion. If you are a Kansas City Chiefs fan, Look, Sammy go Watkins, to footclangiveaway.com to win this signed Sammy friends Watkins. Friends and family of Sammy Watkins. <laughs> <laughs> this is available. All uh, the the all the uh, the lizard, <laughs> oh yeah, lizard rep- people, oh, reptilian yes. community. Go he, to footclangiveaway dot com. Your king has a helmet at <laughs> footclangiveaway.com. That's a quote. Your king has a helmet. <laughs> find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. You'll find out about everything that's going on around Foot Clan headquarters and beyond. We've got the ultimate draft kit, which is available for pre sale, lowest possible price on Super Bowl Sunday, just like it was last year. And we're like Jason said, we're already. Uh, you know, working on it. We're already getting things 
rolling Upgrade. towards 2020. Some upgrades, some uh, improvements to the mobile app, some new features uh, sure to make their way into the 2020 UDK. So very excited about that. You can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. And obviously we support all, or we appreciate all your support at join the Look, We support your, your support, support yes. of our supports. Yeah. If your support had a Patreon, we would support it. For 100%. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the news. News and notes from around the league. All right. This is big, big news, guys. The NFL draft is legitimately going to have I'm on a boat. They're going to have a fountain. Uh, the <laughs> NFL draft is going to be on the a, water on of, the, on, uh, of the Bellagio. It's going to be built out. And oh. then they're going to bring the players to the draft stage on a boat. Mike, Mike saw this yesterday. We're in this, we're in the office yeah. and he's like, Oh my gosh, they're going to put the stage on the fountains of the Bellagio and boat players to it. And I, I let him know, like, I had seen that. I'm like, Mike, no, I'm pretty sure that's a hoax. That is, I mean, that's not real. Like, that's a funny goof. Right. That's good. It's in Vegas. But it's, like, not for real. I hope <laughs> it's, it's super for real. It's super for real. Clark County, Nevada's verified Twitter account is sharing the plans. And, um, yeah, that's legit. I hope they forget to turn the fountains off. Oh, yeah. And... <laughs> Oh, I yeah, hope. like the sprinklers come on in the yard type <laughs> yeah, of thing? Yeah. I Except hope instead of sprinklers, everyone's just getting a power-washed enema. Oh, they, they're, getting, oh. <laughs> they're getting shot up into the yeah, air? Those things are f ferocious power, Jason. Roger Goodell gets sent up 40 feet before <laughs> he splashed moon. down. I can't wait to see all of the fancy suits with the life jackets on over. <laughs> Put this on if you're getting in that boat. I, it's ironic. It's like four feet of water here. We were just there. We just walked by yeah. the Bellagio for the uh, Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association conference, and I asked you two gentlemen how much I'd have to pay <laughs> to take a jet ski out you on did. that for an hour just to, you know, have you, a good time. Can the number one pick request a jet ski? Oh. Like Burrow. I mean, the thing, look, Burrow, he, he's got the swag. Yeah. If anyone's going to ask for a jet ski, he's going to do it. Look, at the end of the day, I just saw the ratings for the conference championship games, and they were uh, they were good in as much as both games drew more than 40 million viewers, but they were actually down from last year, and there's only one way to combat that, and it is obviously <laughs> a draft on the water. So well done, NFL. Uh, some other fantasy-relevant news, the uh, Browns are expected to hire ex-Redskins offensive line and, uh, what, temporary head coach Bill yes. Callahan. This is very interesting. Kevin Stefanski, run-heavy coach. I'm going a, I'm to a outman you with how, we run the, how much we run this ball. Bill Callahan, more man than Kevin Stefanski when it comes to running the ball, got production out of Adrian freaking Peterson on Washington who could do nothing for a while with Dwayne Haskins. Like we're very very early in the process, but if you if if you are not getting excited for Nick Chubb right now, then you are not alive. If Kareem Hunt signs somewhere else as is very much in the realm of possibility and you've got the Callahan led desire to run offense with Nick Chubb there, that's going to be a, a top five back. Well, there were a lot of people when Stefanski went to uh, be the head coach of the Browns that said, well, let's not oh, you know, let's not just apply the Dalvin Cook success. What he wants to do as the head coach, is that more Zimmer? Well, you don't go hire Bill Callahan right? unless you are leaning into your strengths. And the truth is that's the strength of that offense. You're not – we saw last year, you know – Say whatever you want about Baker Mayfield's ceiling, his range of outcomes. He wasn't able to just muster up a successful offense on improvisation, on getting outside the pocket, on overcoming the offensive line. Their team ran, you know, their offense was successful because of Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And so I would just go as far as to say, even if Kareem Hunt is coming back, I am very enthusiastic about this offense. Nick Chubb's season was not dependent on touchdowns, and it was not dependent on the passing game work and success in the passing game. So I still think it's a very stable base for a top 10 running back if Stefanski, Callahan are there, even with Hunt, personally. Yeah, I agree. So Kyle Shanahan said Tevin Coleman suffered a dislocated shoulder in the title game. So Oof. we'll see if he's available. I would be projecting Brita for more work than Coleman, but we'll see. If Coleman's active... 
then uh, he'll probably be involved. Yeah, and so then, it's the big game. He's going to be juiced up. It's the big game. Yeah. Jay Gruden. This, offensive, is a, this is a big deal, man. Offensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Like Jay Gruden, it didn't work out for him to be a head coach. I mean, I thought he did his, all right with he did what okay. he was given. Yeah, to, to his credit, I thought he did okay. Uh, he maybe even did better than he should have given his circumstances. But it's a long, it's a long time ago. But you guys remember Andy Dalton? Oh, yeah. When Dude. Jay Gruden was the OC for Cincinnati? There's a reason Jay Gruden went from OC to head coach, and it's right. because of what he was able to do when he was an offensive coordinator with the Bengals. I think this is a uh, really solid hire, and um, you know, it's uh, I think it's good news for Leonard Fournette, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do there. Is it great news for Gardner or Nick Foles? Well, that's going to depend on who the who the who, starting quarterback I, is, Mike. But that's a that's a under the mattress way of asking. Who's the quarterback, Jason? I think it's it, going to be Gardner. Okay. Yeah, the hiring of Jay Gruden leans me more towards Foles than not. But we'll see. the The truth is, is and we had um, uh, who who is my lifelong favorite head coach? Hugh. Oh, I guess that's true. Hugh Jackson. Like, he came out and said that you the, shouldn't hold his Browns record against him. And what? Like, like, what? So, so I'm picturing the application, the coaching application. <laughs> Jay Gruden, like, if you have coached the Washington Redskins, you get the asterisks. And then the asterisks, you look down at the bottom of the page, and it says, is the Redskins. Right. And then the asterisks for Hugh Jackson is the Browns. So Gruden did a lot with what he had there. I thought, you know, firing him was just, like, the next thing on the list to do for dissatisfaction in your team, but nothing to do with his performance. I like him. I think he's good for Jacksonville. And uh, that's it Don't for the news. hold that against me. <laughs> you went winless, man. That's impossible. Well, not impossible because you did it, but <laughs> you almost did it twice, <laughs> yes. which is super impressive. Get out of here. Yeah, fair enough. Beat the Ballers, presented by Monkey Knife Fight. All right, the running back truth, part two, coming up. First, I want to jump in to beat the ballers. Last week, congratulations, Foot Clan. You, uh, uh, all you turds who played Mostert against you us. You destroyed us. Ah. Now, Mike was the best of the three of us. He only beat 28% of the Foot Clan with 45 points. That's with Derek Henry, Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill. Hill had a great week. Kelsey. Henry, Kelsey, not so much. Mike beat 28% of you. Jason beat 18% of you with 40 points. I beat just 11% of you, you're welcome, with 36 points. You got mostered it as well because you took San Francisco players. Not I had named Kittle Raheem Mostert. and Samuel. Yeah, so 528 users beat us last week, shared the, uh, shameful. shared the monetary reward for doing so. The Ballers Bowl is coming. The Ballers Bowl means there's a $10,000 prize pool. Whee! Next week, we are going to each pick one player from the Super Bowl. And we're going to form one team. I'm going to take Raheem Mostert. <laughs> You're going to take just, Raheem just, Mostert. I don't want to spoil next week, but there's no way I'm not taking Raheem Mostert. So that's you your can't guy. talk. Well, I mean, we got to talk about this as a group. Right. We're going to put one team together, the three of us, one player each. If you beat us next week in the Ballers Bowl, there's a $10,000 prize pool heading your way. More of those details are coming next week when we make the picks. And uh, we'll tell you how to enter. And obviously, if you've beat us, if you... Have, You're not going to. Well, in the past, over the last three oh, weeks. yes. If yes. you've beaten us and you've got your Ballers Bowl entries, you'll be able to add as many entries um, as you've won. And thank Andy for your free entry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad we've rotated back to me being the stink. Mike's never been the stink. No, That's he's Jay right. Jason and I have been uh, alternating maybe, stink. Maybe we should have Mike pick our Maybe team. I should pick Mostert and you should pick... Tyreek, so that we don't mess this thing up. Mm. You, so you're thinking if I pick Moster and you pick Tyreek. We're doomed. We're doomed. Because that's we, what happened two weeks ago. Yeah. Or what yeah. if Mike just picks our team? Yeah. That would also help the equation. Uh, my do, shoulders are ready. Do you think that – so lots of people out there playing beat the ballers. It's been a really fun time it's through the playoffs. It's made the playoffs pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. Do you believe that the people out there are wanting – us to have a really good roster? No. So that if they beat us, they get a larger share of the 10,000? Uh, okay. Or are they hoping like, oh, man, we just we stink and it's just easy winnings? 
I would imagine they want us to be just worse than their score. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's regardless of what that means. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, next week you'll be able to check uh, it out, beattheballers.com. We'll make our picks on next week's episode before the Super Bowl. Can't wait. Going to be a lot of fun. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, we're back in the truth of the fantasy football running back position from 2019, breaking down the consistency of a ton of running backs, looking at how many great games they had, how many good games, how many bust games. Did they perform uh, you know, up to their fantasy finish? And one guy that did, the next guy on the list, Leonard Fournette. Number nine, that's where he finished. His consistency rank was number nine. And... You know, we talked earlier on the show about how we were looking at last year's projections. My projection for Leonard Fournette was pretty spot on until you walked up to the receiving totals and he legitimately doubled the target total I had projected for him last year. He had 100 targets. I think I had him down for 52. He ended up with 76 receptions and that led to a top 10 year in terms of performance and consistency. Well, I mean, honestly, when you're going into your projections, you got to project Leonard Fournette to have more targets than Alvin Kamara. Oh, my god. I mean, gosh. Like, that's that's easy. More than James White, Le'Veon Bell, Saquon Barkley. I mean, that's easy pickings. Well, yeah, Leonard Fournette is known as a scat back. <laughs> He's one of those tiny third down guys you bring in uh, and just great fluid pass catcher. Fourth most targets at the running back position. But here's here, so here's a problem with that. The, this was part of what made him consistent, right? We're talking about what was the truth of this previous year, and also what do we expect the truth of next year to be? Well, this previous year, part of the reason he was so consistent is that target volume. He had so few touchdowns for the yardage he had, a huge positive regression uh, type of swing you could predict because you look at his utilization, his carries, his yardage, he should have had far more touchdowns. He had a touchdown on every 88 carries. That's ridiculous, especially for a guy of Leonard Fournette's caliber. But with those touchdowns lacking, the passing work made up for it. So that made him a, a little bit more consistent. But going forward, you say, well, what is the truth? Is he now a, a high-volume passing back? Obviously, the team, the quarterbacks there, they're willing and able to do that. But I... I think one of the most interesting things for me going into next year is what do they do with the running back position? Right. As in, they lost TJ Yeldon. They didn't really replace him with anyone. They brought in a rookie who basically had the same profile as Leonard Fournette as a, a big-bodied, you know, goal-line type of not pass-catching guy. If they go out and sign someone, I think that that, that would be good for them as a team. And – that would m make me not project another hundred reception right. uh, targets next year. Well, they were six and ten; they didn't succeed. So you have to look at the situation and say, "Are you going to go back to the same well? Was it Leonard Fournette's fault? No. I mean, he had a good season. He was one of the only consistent pieces of that team. But you're right; you're staring at the draft, and and at the same time, you have to look at the lesson learned from Leonard Fournette that we could apply to other situations. When the draft was over, when free agency was over, you looked at Jacksonville and we all looked at each other and said, well, there ain't, there's no one there. Right. So, you know, in absence of, of these other options meant a necessity to involve Fournette in the passing game. They didn't trust any. It was so comforting when you were a Fournette owner to have third down come along, two-minute drill come along, and he's not off the field like he was in years past with T.J. Yeldon. So he was uh, very consistent this year. Yeah, it, and like Jason said, though, it was the touchdowns, three rushing touchdowns. And what was interesting when I was looking at his numbers, he's he was tied for 10th for the most carries inside of the 10. I mean, that's excellent. I want my running backs getting carries inside the 10. But of those, of those top 10, he was the only running back who did not have double-digit carries inside the five. So they, clearly there was an offensive problem once they got inside the red zone. They had a really hard time getting from the 10 to the 5. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the big problems in Jacksonville. And maybe that was Fournette's fault. I don't know. Yeah, more receptions this season than he had in 2016, 17, and 18 combined. That's incredible. 
That is an incredible stat. All right, moving on. Saquon Barkley. Oh, look at those first six weeks of Saquon. Yeah. And uh, you weren't happy with where you took him. I mean, he was the number one pick probably in more drafts than anybody else. He ended up at number 10 on the year, dealt with injury, obviously, the uh, the ankle sprain, and ended up consistency rank of number 14. And a reminder, we don't count missed games in consistency. So we just took the games he was active when you would have started him, and instead of getting the number one, you got number 14 in consistency. Yeah, when I was building the, the consistency stuff out, you expect a guy like Saquon to remind you, a la Devontae Adams. To, when when you get to the consistency stuff, you go, oh, he was a lot better than we right. remember because he was injured and he was gone. And it's like, oh, yeah, Devontae Adams, really bad season due to injury, but he was still consistency ranked number four. Whereas here with Saquon, just in the games where he was playing, he was 14th. He was super disappointing. And, you know, the truth of that is – he got injured with a high ankle sprain, and when he came back, he said he didn't feel himself for a while. He certainly didn't look himself. For seven games, he was averaging 17 carries for 53 rushing yards. Wow. When he came back from the ankle injury. Yeah, your fantasy team didn't feel like itself. And then the final three games, explosion, averaged 21 carries for 131 yards. I mean, granted, the matchups were there for Saquon Barkley. You could see that his playoff run was should be sensational. It's a it's a really difficult season for me to gauge for for Saquon because he he was great at the beginning. He you looked like, "Oh, I'm getting Saquon." You had the injury, you had a quarterback change. What was unfortunate was his targets, those dropped pretty significantly. You know, he had 121 his rookie year, 73 last year, but but he, but he was pacing out but he was pacing out for 90 targets okay. on the year. So I it, a drop of 30 targets, that's that's pretty substantial. And so I looked at with Eli versus Daniel Jones, I mean, he averages two fewer targets a game when it's not Eli Manning. Is yeah, that, Jones is, driving the ball down the field a little bit more. A, is that a trend that will continue? That remains to be seen. I lean on the side of, yeah, I think, I think Daniel Jones won't check it down as much as Eli. But you saw – I'm very thankful for the end of the year for Saquon. Yeah, because I think it it put him in the right place in terms of going into next year. Like there are very few running backs I would even consider above Saquon Barkley. Like I'm taking Saquon Barkley over Dalvin Cook next year. So you I mean, you I mean, have him pretty two. locked in a number he's, two. He's pretty much number two. If you want to make the Zeke argument, I'm fine with that. But I you Is know Henry in the argument there. No, because he's no. not a pass catcher. Because he's not a pass catcher. No, I want um, you know Saquon was injured. He showed the ramifications of that breakaway play problems from injury through those before the last three games. But this is Saquon. He's a centerpiece of the team, top draft pick. Um, I, you know, to me, I'm not very concerned. I do worry about the targets. I expect them to go down from where his rookie season was. I was talking about that last year with Daniel Jones coming in. That's the worry is they're not going to go up from where he was. They can only go down or stay the same. And so, Going forward, I think you're projecting him for around 100 targets instead of the 120 he had his rookie season. Uh, I'll so, take it. Yeah, I mean, look, if we're talking about that as a negative. Yeah, 100 targets. Still had 52 receptions on a short season for 438 yards through the air. So, and if you if you want a spot for positive regression, eight carries inside the five, one touchdown from inside the five. I mean, that's pretty rare. Is he is he locked in your top three, or is he is I, he? Are you dancing with where I, he's at? I wouldn't, he, but probably a top three. I, I think you can lock him in there. But I'm, I think Dalvin Cook is up there for me. I know I was playing the devil advocate against Dalvin Cook, but right now I think Dalvin belongs up there as well. All right, before we move on to the next running back, we want to thank today's sponsors for supporting the show. And I want to talk to you about Bank United. Bank United wants you to go for more. Here's what you can do. You can enter for a chance to win $54,000 if a team goes for 54. and completes a two-point conversion during the big game on February 2nd. All you have to do to be eligible is follow at Bank United on Twitter and tweet at Bank United your answer to what you would do with $54,000 using the hashtag GoForMore54. Everyone has a chance to win. The more tweets you send, the more chances you have to win. And if a team completes a two-point conversion, you could win. 
Again, follow Bank United on Twitter and tweet at Bank United your answer to what you would do with fifty-four thousand dollars. Fifty-four. Using that's a lot of Sammy Watkins helmets mm. that you could buy. <laughs> Um, for official rules, visit www.goformore54.com. That's go for more and the number 54.com. Bank United, NA, member FDIC. Neither Twitter nor the NFL entities have offered, administered, endorsed, or sponsored the sweepstakes in any way. That's go for more54.com. And we want to thank Sonos not only for being a longtime supporter of this show, but for making the best today's level speaker. Can you imagine? Listening to this podcast on a Sonos. I've done it. I don't have to imagine, Mike. It's got to be sensational. It is phenomenal. My voice sounds perfect. No, Especially the, when you sing, Mike. The truth Whoa. is... <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> Sonos is what, like... You, you know how there's all these products that they're, they're designed by, like, today's standards? Right. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, like we talk about, like oh, Apple came out and they right. made the iPhone, and they just right. took phones to where that. That's what I feel like. Sonos speakers are. They've got the true, like you know, the, they adjust themselves. You can have them set up like some professionals coming into your house and getting all the sound set up perfect. You can pull out your phone and adjust the volume of the TV that you're watching. All of their devices pair together and work really nicely. So you just keep adding a speaker here or there, upstairs, downstairs. It's just phenomenal. I've never had anybody that we've recommended Sonos before be like, eh, I'm disappointed yeah. because they're never disappointed. They're awesome. So check them out. Make sure you get Sonos all across your house. Go to Sonos.com to learn more. That's Sonos, S-O-N-O-S.com. All right, number 11. Number 11, my guy, Chris Carson. Ended up with a consistency rank of number 17. Oh, he fumbled and bumbled his way through a pretty impressive yeah. season. 278 carries. Love it. 1,230 yards on the ground, seven touchdowns, 37 receptions on 47 targets. Um, when you look back at the season for Chris Carson, uh, what are your takeaways? I mean, this was a, a pretty consistent player from weeks one through 10. He was the running back seven. What the, do you think? The story for Chris Carson for me is, number one, the dude's a beast. He, he is – he fits perfectly in the system that Seattle wants to run. But the big story was the fumbling. They, he had a stretch. The, the first three games, he fumbled in each of them. Pete Carroll seemed to weather that storm and say, well, he hasn't been a fumber before. Where we're gonna fumber? I heard fumber as well. He hasn't been a fumber. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, he has not been a fumber. That's true. To this day. I, to one, this. one time I caught a fumber. Huh. I don't recommend it. But he, was, he wasn't a fumbler. <laughs> what, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I a fumber. It just, it's a creature. Yeah, it's, it's a that's, Pokemon. That's what it sounded like. <laughs> okay, All like right. you never leveled up your fumber. Yeah. Okay. Look. To a fumbler. I mean, you. The second stage of the fumber is a fumbler. Of course. Yeah. It's so he was fumbler. a fumbler last year. So he fumbled the first three games. They moved on. But then he had a stretch, another three game run of four combined fumbles, and after that happened, that's when Rashad Penny got his shot, and Rashad Penny came in, had two monster games, was establishing himself as a huge part of this offense, unfortunately went down with a very severe injury. So that's the question for, for me on Chris Carson. Let's say Rashad Penny still isn't ready to start the season because with, with what happened to his knee, there's a very high chance that, that that happens. Will they bring someone else in? What type of resources do they use to bring in another backup because they're going to have to bring somebody, and you can't move forward with another uh, season of it's Chris Carson. Then we have guys, uh, we have JD McKissick, we have uh, guys just getting hurt behind him. You yeah, have to bring CJ someone. Procise. In. Yeah, that I couldn't remember his name. Procise. What level do they bring in behind Chris Carson? And does Carson fumble again? Here's what I know. I know that even if Rashad Penny's healthy, they're not going to look at a player coming off of that severe of an injury and say. Um, well, you, exactly. this is your backfield. So Carson should have a role there if he's if he's back with the team, which he should be. He avoided surgery with the hip injury, and so I I doubt we go into next season projecting very differently a season for Chris Carson than we did this past one. Yeah, it's just a matter of if they make a splash in free agency or in the draft and get a running back that could possibly take over as the starter. This is a contract year for Chris Carson. Yeah, there's not and, a lot of money committed his direction. Yeah, there's he's yeah he's. Well, Not I, even I a million dollars. I, I just think a, 
we'll see what happens with his ADP because he could be a very risky pick. Yeah, I mean, th this last year, the truth about Chris Carson is that he was great. Uh, he had, obviously, the, the injury towards the end and the fumbling in the beginning. But if you look at the middle stretch of games, they talked about getting him more involved in the passing game. And he was 15th most routes run at, at running back. So um, Had that sweet double catch touchdown. <laughs> he, had, yeah. he had seven seven separate weeks inside the top 10 on weekly finish. Yeah, I mean, he, he, was, a, he was a solid player. Just a tough beginning, tough end of the season. That's kind of what ruined his uh, consistency going forward next year. If the, if the depth chart looks like it looks now, I'll be all in on Chris Carson. Sure. Yeah, the fumbling is so, so annoying. It's so frustrating because it does it, it betrays, you know, this was not a player making the wrong cut or the wrong read or dropping passes or doing something wrong in the pass protection. It was just like, here you are with this one part of your game that is stealing the ability for fantasy owners to stay confident in you. So it was a good, not great year for Carson. Here's where the truth really comes out. Number 12, Alvin Kamara. He was actually number six overall in fantasy consistency at the running back position. I think that's in, in, insightful. I think that's kind of not how it felt. I think for a lot of people, maybe those week 16, 17 weeks that Kamara had really nice numbers on didn't matter for you at all because you didn't make the playoffs because you didn't get what you thought you were getting out of Alvin Kamara. We looked at all our projections. Obviously, they fell short by a significant margin. We knew the touchdown regression was potentially coming. But, you know, it was just an up-and-down year for Alvin Kamara. But the truth is he was still one of the best fantasy running backs for your roster. Yeah, and, and, the, and you know, the, the pendulum swung uh, too far, you know, in the, in the touchdown regression. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you expect, look, he's assuming Drew Brees is back, he's still going to be a phenomenal asset that was very good this year, just disappointing because of injury. And somewhat similar to Saquon, he had an injury where he was dealing with it once he was back for a while. You weren't getting those big, high upside games that you, that you want to get. But, I mean, if you look at both Saquon and uh, Kamara, they missed games, and they both had, you know, a similar injury and struggled through that. Kamara was better. As far as just being more consistent, not having – I mean, you brought up that line of Saquon's run of seven games right. where he was getting 17 rushing attempts and like 50, 50 yards, basically. yards a game. That's Kamara was still solid, and I think that the touchdowns go back up. So, I'm uh, – you know, I, I think Kamara is someone that you've got to wash away this season – uh, similar to Devontae Adams, and don't just say, oh, he took a step down, and that's the direction he's trending. We're going to lower him out of the tier he was in. I, I keep him in the tier that he was yeah, at I, draft. I still have him as a top-tier running back. His rushing yards were, uh, were almost exactly the same. Wait, You can't what? say top-tier anymore because that's a tier oh, is that, unto it, itself. Well, it, I know what you're uh, saying. A-tier, A-tier, okay. because Christian McCaffrey, yes. as we know, is in the S-tier. Yeah. Okay, there you go. A-tier, <laughs> S-tier, got yes. it. I know it doesn't make sense, but this is where we are. So his rushing yards per game almost identical. His yards per recep per reception <laughs> struggling per, over here per yeah. reception they dropped a little bit. Adam Reshefter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I got but you. I got you. He was actually pacing uh, higher in total receptions. The big thing was the touchdowns. In 2018, Kamara had 13 carries inside the five that turned into eight touchdowns. Like That's was, good. He was having. Excellent success up there. Last year, only eight carries that turned into three touchdowns inside the five. So, like, you, you, where where was the problem with Kamara? Right there. And, I mean, you had Teddy Bridgewater for a good stretch of this season. The Saints, just their offense wasn't as strong. But I'm, I'm still all in on Alvin Kamara. If there's any type of dip where he's dropping to the back of the first, that will be nonsense. I think, I think he's actually a good trade for a target. Because sure. the people who had him were really disappointed this year with the injuries. They might have missed the playoffs. They might think poorly of him. But, I, I, you know, if you can get him cheaper than, you know, the tier he was drafted this year, which based on what he did this year, I think you can, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't hate that. So, for, like, are you speaking for Dynasty? Yeah. Cause, okay. So you, you still, still have him. He's still only 24 years old. Sure, but he's, he'll be in a contract year. I'm pretty confident that this is Drew Brees last year. Now, that's – just projection and speculation, but Breeze is signed through this year. Are you that comfortable paying 
up because you, you, there might be a slight dip, I guess, in dynasty price, but you're still going to pay for Alvin Kamara. Are you confident in him moving forward for the future years? I mean, when Drew Brees is gone, that's going to that's going to hurt every offensive player for the Saints. Um, but how can you project Drew Brees' future career decision? I don't know. So I'm just going to take talent right okay. now. I would say the one kind of uh, interesting development this year in New Orleans was the just everywhere involvement of Taysom Hill, especially around the goal line, direct snaps, opportunities for him to get into the end zone. I wouldn't – you know, we, we can look very strictly at, okay, he, he regressed touchdown-wise and he regressed too far, but part of why that regression happened was – other priorities around the goal line. Sure. It wasn't just handing the ball to Alvin Kamara. So depending on the involvement of Taysom Hill, that could affect, you know, the positive regression. Taysom needs a new contract. Does he? Yep. Interesting. He'll get it. All right, number 13, Joe Mixon. His consistency rank was 22. Now, does that betray the truth of Joe Mixon? Because I know, think it's fair. This is a player that before the week nine bye – Eight fantasy points per game, 54 total yards per game. After the bye, 17.2 fantasy points per game, 124 total yards per game. You're talking about somebody that was uh, had the fifth most carries in football, number one in evaded tackles, passed the eye test on every play he took the ball to me the entire season, even the, even the bad games. He's a player that runs very hard. Uh, you know I'm kind of in love with Joe Mixon. Yes. But – uh, look, from week eight on, he was dominant on a team that stunk. So He was so bad in the beginning of the year. I don't know if we remember. People cut Joe Mixon. Yeah. Joe Mixon, who was super highly drafted. I mean, those first seven weeks, he was so bad that it wasn't even just a, I know I can't start him anymore. It's I don't want him on the roster. And that obviously, if you did that, was a mistake. If you take away those first seven games, when you say, does the consistency score betray his season, it feels like it because you look at the second half from week eight on, he would have been the consistency rank number six. He was hyper consistent the rest of the year once the team realized we are going for that yeah, number it, one. I mean, it doesn't really betray it because we're looking at the season in totality, but it shows you the potential for Joe Mixon. And I think he's going to be somebody that, you know, in Zach Taylor's second season, likely with Joe Burrow behind center. There, there's just a lot to like about what you got out of Joe Mixon over the back half of the year because you saw all the potential on a team where, you know, he had five touchdowns on the year on the ground. Um, not heavy passing game involvement like we thought we would see because the offense didn't have the ball a lot. The offense didn't move the ball a lot. And still, to put up all of those top ten finishes over the back half of the year, I think there's a lot to be excited about personally, uh, even though you were disappointed over the first six games. Are you concerned at all that he will slip like in or not slip sneak like into the back of the second round and is your confidence that high that you would draft him there am i concerned he'll sl i i'm I, I would love it if he did that you would take him in the second round joe mixon yeah. i would yeah okay i think joe mixon he was in my top my top 12 overall picks for next year so for me his value lies at the back of the first round for me oh so i think joe mixon is a player what's his ceiling I mean, the ceiling would be definitely a top 10 running back if he gets involved in the passing game. You can talk about there's room for the offensive line to improve. They can't get much worse than they were last year. Room for the team to improve. You can't get much worse than last place. <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think there's ways to go up. I, I'm not 100% sure that Joe Burrow coming in is an upgrade for him, though. You know, Joe Burrow might be great, but as a rookie coming in... Have you ever watched... Uh, who filled in for Andy Dalton? I can't oh, even remember his name anymore. Oh, my God. Finley? Was that... Uh, yeah, Ryan Finley. Yeah, he, oh, my word. And he Andy Dalton. So I mean, sure, but Dalton still played the let's majority it, of the season. Let's call it neutral. I mean, let's call it neutral second, second season learning how to use the guy. Here's all I'm saying is you're going to be facing decisions in next year's draft about, boy, am I taking the Hopkins, the Thomas... You know, the Devontae Adams in the first round. I'm fine with Joe Mixon as my running wow. back uh, with my running back one. Ooh, I'm spicy. excited about Joe Mixon spicy. as my running back one. So um I don't know if that makes me a Joe Mixon so you, apologist or optimist, but I am both. You believe <laughs> both. you believe the second half of the year is more indicative of how they'll utilize him going forward. They Absolutely. found something with him. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean it wasn't look, we, we didn't know at the time. 
I mean, but week one, you were you were in Seattle. Okay, terrible week. Week two, you were facing San Francisco. We didn't know what their San Francisco defense was going to be. Fair. You faced Buffalo the next week. They were you strong. You faced Pittsburgh the next week. Strong. You played D. Baltimore in week six. So uh, between new coach, new quarterback for part of the year, and that offensive line, I'm making the excuses. I want to make the excuses for Joe Mixon because film tells me he's a top five talent in the NFL. He's unbelievable. Man, on they film. just they really started feeding him the ball. Yeah, over that second half, you're they like, did. Be basically just averaging over 20 carries a game. Yeah, number one in evaded tackles according wow. to Player Profiler. I love, good you, run, I love you, Joe. All right, number 14, Todd Gurley, one of the more talked about players heading into the season. Number 14. Finish wise, consistency rank number twelve, and guys, I have no idea what on earth you do with Ty Gurley <laughs> moving forward. Thirteen percent bus games, seventy three percent good games, just seven percent great games. That's hard to deal with as a Todd Gurley owner, and it, isn't it kind of the hardest thing to do in fantasy to adjust expectation on a player that used to be the number one and decide what you do with them and what they would be. You know, who would you rather have as your running back one heading into next year based on today's rosters? Would you rather have Joe Mixon or Todd Gurley? Ooh. You know, yeah. that that's a uh you know, even with that nasty start to the season, Mixon outperformed Gurley in terms of total fantasy points. So well, and that's with Gurley getting twelve rushing touchdowns. I mean that that is an excellent number for a guy who uh, you know eight hundred and fifty seven yards on the ground. Yeah, that's that was the problem. The problem was it wasn't the touchdowns, it was a combination of all of a sudden, his passing work started to evaporate by comparison to the previous two years, and his efficiency in the running game was terrible. Obviously, the offensive line was horrific. He, you know, he has been one of the most, uh, you know, one of the players that is the most determinate upon their offensive line hmm, I can ever remember. You think about did it. Think about uh, when Another Jason Morris Jeff climbs up. <laughs> sure. When Jeff Fisher was yes. there. and they Dependent? Were, Is that the word you're looking for? Most dependent on their offensive line? Let's go with that. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, I'm I like the way that sounds. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the change. Al Borland is laughing over here. The change. That's what he meant, to, right, Al? Yes. I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the change when McVay came in. McVay got all the credit, but Andrew Whitworth came in, and the offensive line changed from really bad to really good. Well, this last year, the offensive line went from really good to really bad, and you know what if they go out and make a, a big splash in free agency? Go out and get uh, to fix the line. Yeah, to 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 fix the line, and and they have a better offensive line. Do you? He got the work. He you know. Well, yeah, he, he kind of got the work, yes. and then and the then, workload went down. That, that is for sure. In 2018, 11 of his 14 games, he was on the field for more than 80 percent of the snaps. Last year, only three times did he see that workload. Jason, you talked about the targets; they went way down. I have no idea what why Sean McVay decided to do this. Only 10 percent of their passes only 10 percent of the rams passes when you have tyler higby mike you don't ignore <laughs> you tyler got a, higby. A, well apparently this is because that dude turned into a beast uh but here was the the, the biggest eye opener for me so sean mcveigh's run with the rams 2017 the rams offense scored 478 points 2018 they scored 527 points last year they scored 394 points and Todd Gurley still had 12 rushing touchdowns. Like it, It's going to be very difficult to be in on Todd Gurley, but if they can fix some of if the they offense. can low-key fix the offensive line, Todd Gurley may present himself as a, a draft value. I, I honestly have no gauge what the public is thinking about Todd Gurley moving forward into next year, but, but like my hunch is he could be – of he could be a value here's, here's in the, the pop, third of the fourth. Pop quiz: How many hundred yard rushing games did he have last year? I'm going with zero. That is correct. Yeah, I I was I'm just thinking I'm thinking through this and realizing that the truth is with Todd Gurley is his season was saved by touchdowns because but that's who he like that's also why he was so great. N no, but if you told me because there was so much Todd Gurley discussion coming into last year, right. the knee, uh, Daryl Henderson, going down. the workload, what, we don't know. But if you told me he gets 14 touchdowns 
I'm, I would say draft him as a top five running back. He's a top five. He got 14 touchdowns, and he didn't finish as an RB1. And what's Daryl Henderson going to be next year? That's a, that's you know, a are they going to use him? But of the running backs with double-digit rushing touchdowns, they all finished top eight, so, except for Todd Gurley. If you took the chance on Gurley over this past year, were you happy? I think, yeah. Maybe, but where was he? He was a second-round pick, right? Yeah, he fell, he fell pretty, pretty heftily. I think you were okay. <laughs> I like that one a lot. Dude. Heftily? Is that even a word? Yeah, with the woozles. Yeah. <laughs> Heftilies and That's... woozles. Very confusals. <laughs> oh, he... Heftilies and the heffalumps? <laughs> That's where I went. Nice. Um, he fell heftily, you were saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in the draft, so... <laughs> I'm on a roll. Let's <laughs> keep going. Oh, my goodness. All right. Um, Miles Sanders is number 15. Miles Sanders was 15 in fantasy finish. He was a consistency rank of 29. He's a rookie, was a rookie. And um, I'm going to contrast him with another one that kind of jumps out. And so Miles Sanders finished there. But if you go down, hold on, let me scroll. Devin Singletary finished at 31 okay, with a consistency rank of 27. So they actually had very similar consistency rankings. How do you look at these numbers? You look at Miles Sanders and, you know, smaller sample sizes is how I look at these rookies. It's it's difficult to put those two guys together because I, I feel like the path forward for Devin Singletary is clear. Like Singletary is the guy now. I I can't project that Frank Gore will be on that team. Devin Singletary is the primary running back for that team. That's how they used him towards the end of the season. Meanwhile, Miles Sanders kind of de factoed into that job. <clears throat> and what I didn't remember is Miles Sanders was basically given the, the starter job. At the beginning of the year, he was, he was getting more carries than Jordan Howard. He was just super effective. He was averaging 11 carries for 35 yards in the first three games. Jordan Howard came in, took the job. Jordan Howard looked great, was a touchdown beast. And then during those games, Miles Sanders was down to seven carries for 38 yards. Howard gets hurt. Miles Sanders uh, gets the job back and is actually pretty good. But he's really, really getting it done in the passing game. He was one of only six rookies ever with 800 rushing yards, 50 receptions, and 500 receiving yards. Just 22 years old. What's difficult for me is you look at those two players, and you said the pathway is clear for Devin Singletary. It's it's ironic because we break these games down, their performances down into great games, good games, bust games. Devin Singletary never had a game that qualified as great. Miles Sanders right. had two of those. He had five good games. He had five times that he finished inside the top ten on the week. So you almost saw, even if he fell more into the opportunity, you saw more ceiling from Miles Sanders over the course of those games. Well, you, you saw than him in, you saw from Singletary in in the air, not in there, but through the air. Yeah, as Miles Sanders was getting it done. There's only three running backs last year that had 40 or more targets and a yards per reception over 10. Miles Sanders, Austin Eckler, and David Johnson. Amazingly, <laughs> David Johnson. But look, Miles Sanders did great with the opportunity he was given towards the end of the year. I think he's talented. The real question, it's all about opportunity. Because by the end of the year, not only was Jordan Howard injured, so he gets more rushing work, but every single receiving right. option on the team was injured. No Alshon, no d uh, no Nelson Aguilar. I mean, they started using... Boston Scott and uh, Miles Sanders. So going forward next year, I don't believe Doug Peterson wants Miles Sanders to be the guy. I think he showed it's tough because he would, they took him in the second round. No, man. I that I is the hard that. part. Fifty third pick overall. I think that they know he's a talented guy and he will be involved. And I think the Eagles' offense, to compare it to the Bills and and Devin Singletary, is better. So the ceiling is there with Miles Sanders because I think more points are scored for the Eagles next year than for the Buffalo Bills. If you could pick a RB two, Sanders or Singletary, I would today. take I would take Singletary today because I believe Singletary will get the opportunity. And I don't know that Miles Sanders will get enough opportunity in the, uh, you know, in just touches. PPR might change that for me. Sure. If, if it's PPR, I think I might go Miles. It's so hard because, I mean, the targets were there for Singletary or getting there. And 
the reality is, is if Gore's gone, it's easy to say now because Gore's probably not back. They'll bring. I mean, he's infinite. They're think, going to bring somebody else I, in. I, I, I mean, Gore, it's not just going to be Singletary. I listened to Gore after the season, and he was asked the question, you know. Do I'm you, just 23 years old. <laughs> you know, I'll be you, back. Why is he Charles Barkley? I don't know. <laughs> do you want Is that to, what that was? It was terrible. It was terrible. I'm 23 years old. Oh, uh, no. Knucklehead. <laughs> Gore wants to play, and he wants to play for the Bills. Uh, and, and, and forever. He wants to play forever. I, sure. I've heard that Carlos Hyde wants back on the Texans, yes. Jason. But I, he's I not, would not. Gore's not under con, uh, would, contract. Uh, no, I know he's not. I would not be surprised at all if the Bills bring back Frank Gore. And if that happens, I think that's best case scenario for Devin Singletary. I would agree with that. It would be best for Singletary. He already overtook Gore. Gore, Gore would be signing to be the back. Been there, beat that. Until the playoffs. <laughs> there we, when you got an opportunity. I love that. Frank Gore the ball in the only playoffs. Eight, eight touches, but they were painful. They ruined the game. All right, let's 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 go here, and you guys can pick out some names that you want to bring up beyond the top 15 here. You know, Kenyon Drake was 16 overall, 16 by consistency. That's impressive for a player that changed teams over the course of the year. Uh, I saw a very large Twitter poll where Gurley and Drake came up dead a dead heat in dynasty drafts. So the, my hot stat for Kenyon Drake it is more just about the Arizona running back, and I tweeted this out. I said, if you take the starting fan the fantasy numbers from the starting running back for Arizona, you got 288 points. That's a running back three on the season. Yes, we got fooled. We got duped a few times of who would the starter be. Mostly that was on David Johnson where you had the game where he came back. that We thought he was healthy, and Chase Edmonds was the guy and had a monster game. Chase Edmonds kind of fell off, got hurt. They trade for Kenyon Drake. You still think David Johnson's the starter because they just traded for Drake, but no, it was Kenny Drake was the dude for the rest of the season. So I am very interested. But the point in, you're the in, point you're yes. making is that the Arizona Cardinals running back with Cliff Kingsbury is an extremely yes. valuable role. If someone has that on lockdown, because they go with one guy. It's, this isn't. This isn't an RB BC where by that, design, right? And that was kind of the biggest rebuttal to the tweet was if you add, if you do that for a lot of teams, it's like, yeah, but Arizona w wanted to feature one guy more often than these other. It just teams. happened to be three different players yeah. over the course of the year. Yes, on individual weeks, and that happens on teams that play fast. Uh, right, we we talk about playing fast for the Cardinals and how many snaps they get in uh, every game. But part of the only way you can do that is by keeping the same personnel on the field. You don't have time to uh, slow the game down and make as many substitutions. They're just going, going, going. They need that skill set feature all around back. And so, yeah, I, you know, Kenya Drake is interesting, but we don't have a clue where he plays football next year. Le'Veon Bell ended up at 17 fantasy finish wise. He ended up at number 13 in consistency. Nice. 0% great game. So he never had a 22 plus point game. He was just very. Middle of the road. But only one bust, so he was... Yeah, I mean, no, he's going if, to get 250-plus carries next year. If you took him in the first, though, oh, or this is where you had he killed you. But yeah. now but now he'll be adjusted. Now there'll be a, a settling of his position. And all I'm saying is, is next year, unless people buy in more than I think they will, I, I, I love the opportunity to potentially get 250 carries on the ground because he's making all the money in the world. Right. Uh, at a better draft day value to be my running back too. That's all I'm saying because these weeks, you know, 11, 9, 10, 10, 10, 11, those are the kind of weeks that I'm really wanting from my RB2. It's just a matter of what what are the new expectations for Lev Bell and, you know, everything you feared came true this year in terms of taking a year off, joining a team with a bad offensive situation and head coach and there we are. Josh Jacobs, number eighteen, but his, awesome. but his consistency rank was number ten. Uh, this, you know, nowhere to go but up for Josh Jacobs, right? Yeah, he he missed three games, according to Pro Football Focus. Josh Jacobs had the most most fist, goodness, most forced missed tackles. That's a mouthful, man. Yeah, you, you, we made it through. Most forced missed tackles. Yes, most forced missed tackles most on rushing attempts. <laughs> most hurts missed tackles. <laughs> Uh, Josh Jacobs was great. He had a heftily amount. <laughs> he was he was so no. Josh Jacobs was not great. Josh yes, Jacobs was, was infuriating because what? 
he was infuriating because why? 27 targets. We went what? And, okay. We, okay. We went and looked That's at, fair. That's on Gruden. Jason and I went and looked at our projections for Josh Jacobs. We nailed it. Oh, we were like, oh, man, we totals. had the same carries and yards and touchdowns. And, we were, and, the, and then you look at the receptions and you go, we all thought he would be involved. He, he should be. He's phenomenal. And he, you took him in the first. You, not only did you take him in the first, but he's got a skill set to be yes. a passing downs guy. But when you have the chance to get Jalen Richard <laughs> the ball, you got to take it. I mean, what? So there's the infuriating. Yeah. That's the infuriating okay. part. That Fair. being said, going forward, I would project them to change that a little bit. I, I think they will get him more involved in the passing game. Is that just wishful thinking? No, it's not. They, they should. And he was struggling with injury on and off, multiple different injuries on and off throughout the year. You wonder if that was kind of a – a very easy way to keep him off the field from getting too much work was just to say, we've got our third down team. You're not on it. You do what you can on first and second down. If a pass comes your way, it was not by design. And and then you're not getting worn down over your rookie season. Maybe that's the philosophy. Richard is not under contract. Thank goodness. Not yet. Yeah, not eight, yet. Eight-year deal brewing. Um, Melvin Gordon at 23. Consistency rank of number 19. Well, Real quick before we leave Josh Jacobs, just remember how much James White is involved in the passing game, and that could be really helpful next year uh, for Josh Jacobs. Are you reminding Gruden that? I'm just saying with for when they get their new quarterback who utilizes oh, that check wait, down guy. Hold on. Brady's playing for the Raiders now? If I call, you're, on your, you're on your third team? If I call it for every team, <laughs> someday I'll be able to come back and say, see? Stop clock. I told you. <sighs> Tom Brady to Josh <laughs> Jacobs over and over and over. In so Gor Vegas. Melvin Gordon, number 19 in consistency. Meh. Okay, where does he end up next year? Raheem Mostert, 24 overall, but eighth in consistency. But that was all based on only the games in which he received double-digit touches, which seems unfair. That's it super unfair. It seems very unfair. That doesn't seem like the definition that we've used throughout <laughs> the previous three and a half shows. No. I just wanted to point out when he was the dude, he was great, but – that's something that all fantasy players know, but you also know you can't guarantee he's going to be the guy on a week-to-week -week basis. They're not the Cardinals situation. Right. They're the situation where even Mostert, Mostert was on fire to end the year, then all of a sudden in one of the playoff games it was Tevin Coleman, and then it was Mostert again. So that shows you kind of what can happen. Um, Mostert on the season was consistency rank RB31 if you look at his entirety. So that feels more uh, accurate. Yeah. He, it's just a player that nobody counted on until they could count on him. David Montgomery, this is a disappointing line, finishes at 25, consistency of 38, and not at all what you hoped for, expected, saw in the preseason. They couldn't run the football. Jordan Howard was gone. Montgomery's supposed to come in and do it. I saw many elite plays for Montgomery, but a lot of inconsistency and an offense that didn't know how to use anybody in a coherent way. Uh, James Conner finished at 33 with a consistency rank of 20. I'm interested on your take of James Conner, like where I mean, you were you were off of him in draft season. I really liked him, and it's hard to gauge his season because uh, he was so hurt. Number one, that's the biggest takeaway for for James Conner. He was very fragile this year. He also was playing running back. Uh, well, uh, Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph were taking snaps for for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but six of his ten games were either good or great. I mean, he had three great games, three good games. It's a where how are you how are you evaluating James Conner moving into next year? Well, I you know you assume things are going to be better with Big Ben, but at the same time, we haven't seen it. Sands Brown and Bell and. Big Ben's getting older, and Connor's had some injury concerns. So I probably look at him right now through the same lens that I look like uh, look at a Marlon Mack okay. category. So tier. like an RB two, yeah, as a, 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 absolutely. I mean, when you knew Connor was in the lineup, you were starting James Connor. Right. The problem became not knowing that. The problem became, and then sometimes he was in the lineup and he was gone. I that mean, was the problem. The problem was you knew he was going to be in the lineup, so he was in your lineup, and you shouldn't because then he took himself out of the lineup because he was made of glass. And, and I the, worry about James Conner next year right. just from what we saw at the end of this year, the amount of times that he got injured, and even in the beginning of the year when he wasn't 
you know, when he wasn't uh, missing the games or taken out, he was just he was falling like the Julio. Every five or six plays, the dude was injured. So I actually worry about that going into next year. Okay. If you told me he plays 16 solid games, I'm all in, and I'm terrified. I'll probably pass him. You know, if he's uh, deep in the second round, that could be a great value, and I'll probably pass him by. Part of it's also what is the identity of the Pittsburgh Steelers moving forward. It seems to be more defensive minded. That's the pieces they invested in. So from a like total play count, total points scored, are we able to just resume what Big Ben had been doing before? They one, they probably don't need to. And and two, we we're missing pieces that we didn't have before. And maybe this team, when they look at the fact that Connor was even out there four times in the last nine weeks, they might need to make arrangements to have more of an RBBC. So that's why I put him in the MAC tier. MAC, we look at the quarterback situation and some of the multiple running backs. Well, I heard that Tom Brady. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's already signed. I have, a, I have a source that I sit next to. He told me Brady's going there. Uh, Damian Williams was 35th, 28th in consistency. When I watched the playoff games, I kind of laughed because you watch Damian Williams play running back and you watch Derrick Henry play running back, and they don't play the same position right. at all. Damian Williams cannot run the football. Damian Williams is a great football player when used in a certain way. So, you know, how, when you sit back at the end of the year, Mike, and you say, what was Damian Williams from what we hoped he would be, I know that there's disappointment. Yes. But there, there is massive disappointment, but what stinks for both Connor and Damian Williams, I, I, was, I was very in on them, but I can't just, like, sit back and say, okay, the, pro the process was completely flawed. It, it's a massive L that I took. I mean, you, you took an L in, in terms of their production, but Damian Williams still had several great games. He's crushing again for fantasy in the NFL playoffs. It's just that the value of the Kansas City running back is is so great, but I, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what to make of Damian Williams yet because it was – it looked like he had lost his job in the middle of the season. It, he was irrelevant. They were playing other guys ahead of him, and I guess that just it didn't work out. So they, so he de facto this, back into the job. Yeah, this team needs a new running back on the roster. I think Andy Reid knows it. I think their general manager knows it. They've done whatever they could do to get the best guy on the field. Right now, that's Damian Williams. It is, and so they're utilizing him in that way. And you're right, that role is valuable, but. They know he's not good enough for what their aspirations are for the position. They That's could, why he was benched. He's under contract for one more year. Right. Next year, after the two year, $5.1 million contract, they could use Cream Hunt. Oh, bring it back. It will never happen, uh, but they could use no. him. And then, uh, do, they, do you want me to talk about somebody? Before we close, you want me to talk about uh, Carry On? Sure. <laughs> Carry On finished at number 53, consistency rank of 23. And uh, he, he technically made it back out on the field in week 16 and 17. Um, but probably some adjusted expectations moving forward for carry on after a couple of years dealing with injury. Yes, the, the injury is it's clearly a, a problem. And if you look at if you look at the game he got injured and left in and, and the game that he came back on. If you take those out, he's the running back seven in consistency. When he was out there, he was OK for full games. Sure. He you know, if we're just looking at his full games, he was still uh, a, a quality running back. The issue now is, is he going to get the opportunity going forward to ever get the workload that matters for fantasy? I don't think if I was the general manager, and I am all about on Johnson, I think he's as talented as Joe Mixon and any other high-level running back out there, but there's no way that he that I would give him that workload. I don't think he can handle it. I mean, he was injured a little bit in college. Then he's been injured in the NFL. So I would make preparations, go sign someone else, go trade for someone else, and have carry on just in a mix of RBBC, which makes him less fantasy relevant. All right. Hope you enjoyed the Running Back Truth Part 2 episode. We want to thank Pristine Auction for sponsoring the show. A Saquon Barkley signed jersey yesterday. Sold for eighty nine dollars and sixty eight right. cents, and that's a that's a big time player right there. Saquon Barkley, hundreds of daily auctions. PristineAuction.com. Use the code. This is important. Use the registration code Ballers, Ballers. and you get a ten dollar credit 
towards your first sports memorabilia purchase. We're going to do some very cool stuff with Pristine this year, giveaways, um, some special offers. We're going to be able to give you guys some gift cards for sports memorabilia. It's going to be a lot of fun. So that'll do it for this truth episode. Excited for next week, guys. The big game is coming. Well, the big game is this weekend. Go Pro Bowl. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Foot Clan, don't forget to upgrade your game day experience and enjoy brilliant sound with a Sonos system. Every speaker is designed from the inside out for incredibly detailed sound, deep bass, and then fine-tuned by Oscar and Grammy-winning producers, mixers, and artists. Getting started is easy. Just plug in your speaker, open the app, then connect all your favorite streaming services or TV. Go to Sonos.com to learn more.